True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. A 13-year-old girl is stabbed to death in her home. A mother receives the call no one ever wants to get. Any parent's worst nightmare has just become her reality. But when police start to investigate, the nightmare turns into a horror story of unfathomable proportions, and she has to face the loss of another child, this time in a very different way. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 48, The Murder of Siska de Toy. Today's episode is sponsored by King Online. As we all try to stay home and stay safe as much as possible, I've been trying to use online shopping wherever I can. It's just safer and so much more convenient. King Online is an online health store with literally everything you need to keep your body fighting fit right now. Their huge range covers your needs for vitamins, supplements, home test kits, health food, hair care and so much more. And they deliver straight to your door throughout South Africa. They'll even make a plan to deliver to you outside of South Africa if you send them an email. Their delivery is fast and their customer service is seriously top-notch. Today, King Online is not just sponsoring this episode. They're also offering True Crime South Africa listeners 10% off your first purchase by using the code TCSA10 by visiting king-online.co.za and ordering your health products using the code TCSA10, you'll not only be scoring a 10% discount from a really amazing online health store, but you'll also be helping to support the show. That website again, it's king-online.co.za, and your 10% discount code is TCSA10. I'll leave all the details in the show notes, and a huge thank you once again to King Online. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our newest Patreon members. A huge thank you goes out to Nicolene, Sean Chevalier, Nicholas Metheny, Thomas Dorman, and Diva Sekwati. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. As always, Any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to keeping the show growing and improving. The episode I'm covering today involves a rather rare type of crime, siblicide, the killing of one sibling by another. While anyone with siblings will likely recall one or two rip-roaring arguments with a brother or sister during their life, it's very rare for things to turn physically violent. It's even rarer for that violence to turn deadly. Today's case also involves another element that we thankfully don't see very often. Both murderer and victim are minors. In researching today's episode, I used a chapter of the book Headline Murders by Chris Carsten, as well as a section from Mickey Pistorius' book Fatal Females. I'd also like to thank Suzette Boyson for her assistance in providing research material, as well as those who spoke to me anonymously about this case and their memories of it. So let's get into episode 48, The Murder of Siska de Toy. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. 
Rhea Dutoy and her husband Dennis, divorced when their three girls, Irene, Siska and Amanda, were relatively young. The family lived in Port Elizabeth, and when the divorce went through, Dennis moved to Jeffreys Bay. He would regularly call to speak to the girls, and they would visit him when they could. As divorce does, it's affected all of the girls differently. Irene, the oldest, was more mature and could better understand the necessity that her parents felt to separate rather than be unhappy together. Amanda, the middle child, seemed to struggle the most with her parents' divorce. She would later say that their life had never been the same after her father left, and at times she felt that if he had just tried a little harder to make things work, everything could have been different. Siska, the youngest child, although missing her father, seemed the least affected of all by the turmoil. She continued to excel at school, and received her Eastern Transvaal colours in netball at the age of 12. Being as close as they were in age, the three girls went through the natural stages of loving each other and fighting. There were times when Irene and Siska were closest, And then there were times when Amanda and Siska spent a lot of time together. From accounts of those outside the family, it seemed the siblings had completely normal relationships. One of the girls, though, was developing a very different view of her family. Amanda would later recount how after her parents divorced and her mother began working outside of the home, she felt more and more like an outsider in the family. She said that Irene would get attention for being the oldest, and Siska would get attention for being the youngest, but she felt like no one noticed her. She was convinced that her sisters were seen as the prettier and more popular of the three, although others would later say that it was Amanda that was seen as the most special. Amanda would claim that her mother reinforced her feelings of isolation by telling others that Irene and Siska always looked neat and lovely, no matter what they wore. Amanda pushed against this by wearing revealing and outrageous clothing in an attempt to get attention. She would also claim that her mother bought gifts for Siska, and when Amanda wanted the same, her mother would say that she hadn't earned them. Amanda's feelings of inadequacy were not limited to her mother, although their relationship was becoming more and more strained. She also felt that her father and her own boyfriend favoured her younger sister over her. She said that her father would phone to chat with the girls, and even though Amanda had answered the phone, he would immediately tell her to call Siska. She also said that he would often only invite Siska to visit him in Jeffrey's Bay. Rhea would describe her parenting style as liberal and said that she allowed her girls to start dating when they were 15 years old. Amanda started dating her first boyfriend, Nico, at the age of 16 and would report that even he seemed more interested in spending time with and money on her younger sister. Whether these stories are true or not cannot be known, They were relayed in a context where it was necessary for Amanda to prove her desperation. Perhaps what is more important is that for Amanda, they were very real. Each incident seemed monumental, as it does when you're a teenager, and these perceived slights began to weigh on her. Amanda's desire for attention would also have increased when her mother started a new relationship and her boyfriend moved into their home. Now there was even less time and attention for her, it seemed. On the 19th of September 1994, Siska and Amanda returned home from school as usual. With their mother now working outside of the home, the girls looked after themselves in the afternoons making their own lunch and completing their homework. Rhea had few qualms about leaving her girls home alone. 
Their five-bedroom house was in a good neighbourhood, Mount Pleasant, and crime rates around this time were not terribly high. When she got a phone call from Amanda at three o'clock that afternoon, she was not immediately alarmed. Amanda liked to talk, and she would often phone her mom at work to ask questions or tell her about something that had happened at school. That day, though, her daughter sounded hysterical. Siska is dead, Amanda said, and Rhea's entire world fell apart. When Rhea de Toy arrived at her home in Mount Pleasant that afternoon, she found the road filled with emergency vehicles. Amanda was seated on the back of an ambulance, her head bandaged. Police would not let her into the house, but would confirm that 13-year-old Siska was dead. As soon as Amanda could, she relayed to police how a masked man had broken into their home. She'd come home and made lunch. Then she and Siska had gone to their bedrooms to do schoolwork. Amanda was studying for exams and needed to buckle down. Then, she said, shortly after she'd settled down, she heard her little sister scream. She'd rushed to the girl's room and ran straight into the intruder. The man had the bread knife she'd used to make lunch in his hand. Its twenty-centimetre blade was red with blood. As she looked into her sister's room, she realised it had to have been Siska's. Amanda said that she'd struggled with the man and he stabbed her in the head and then fled from the house. She'd cradled her sister in her arms as she died, she told police between sobs. Siska's room was not in disarray. One teddy bear lay on the floor, along with the 13-year-old girl's body, in a large pool of blood. An autopsy would find that Siska de Toy had sustained 12 stab wounds to her chest and abdomen. Six of the wounds penetrated her lungs, and the forensic pathologist, Dr. Ivor Lang, would confirm in his report that five of those wounds would have been fatal on their own. The punctures to Siska's lungs meant that they had flooded with blood. After losing consciousness, it's estimated that she would have died within ten minutes. The attack appeared to have been frenzied, and I cannot help but think of the word overkill when I think about one stab wound almost for every year of the child's life. Police worked with Amanda to draw up an identikit of the perpetrator, but it was less than helpful considering the girl couldn't even tell police what race the man was for sure. A reward of 50,000 rand was offered for information leading to the arrest of Siska's killer, and Mount Pleasant and the Toy family settled into an uncomfortable state of disbelief and terror. Rio was terrified that the killer may come back for Amanda, and they still had a funeral to plan, one that no parents should ever have to arrange. Siska's funeral was enormous, attended by family, friends and schoolmates. The police also attended Siska's funeral, as is common in many murder cases. The detective in charge, Derek Nosworthy, who you may remember from the Stuart Wilkin episode, did not feel quite right about their current story around the crime. It simply didn't make sense that someone would break into a house with the intent to steal, but take nothing. Instead, he would kill a defenceless teenager in such a gruesome way, but then only superficially wound her sister before fleeing. For what purpose? It simply made no sense. He did feel that whoever killed Siska had known her, though. And by attending the funeral, he hoped to spot anyone that may pique his suspicion. Rhea, Irene and Amanda were inconsolable at the funeral and Nosworthy noted that as Siska's casket was being lowered into her grave, Amanda stepped forward and tossed a note on top of it. Soil was tossed into the grave, and soon covered both the note and her sister's casket. The bereaved family was unaware of the rumours that had started flying around town 
even as they stood at Siska's graveside. The late 80s and early 90s in South Africa were a time of the so-called satanic panic, and the people of Mount Pleasant had started to speculate that perhaps Siska had been a sacrifice of some sort. Amanda was commended for her bravery in trying to save her sister, and received much sympathy for having had to watch the child die in her arms. She would take her keepsake home from Siska's grave that day, a bunch of flowers purchased for the casket. Amanda hung it up in her room and watched it as it started to dry out and die, the petals scattered across her bedroom floor. She took some of Siska's teddy bears off of her bed and slept with them, regressing, it seemed, to a childlike state in her grief. She wrote letters to her mother as well, attempting to console her. Amanda had always loved writing letters, and it would be her undoing. The Satanism rumours eventually made their way back to the family through the police, who questioned Amanda about any involvement she may have had in the occult. The girl vehemently denied it, and soon there seemed to be no substance to that lead either. A psychic known to work with the PE police at the time was even called in to see if she could pick up anything from the scene. She would later say that she had noticed nothing strange about the scene, and had no feeling that Amanda was involved. She did say that there was an intense anger emanating off Rhea, and she wonders if that perhaps was why she didn't pick up anything at the time. She would go on, according to her, to successfully assist the police in other cases. Nosworthy still felt that the intruder story had little to offer them in terms of leads, and instead followed his gut, and continued to focus on the Detoy family and those close to them. He studied photographs he'd taken at the funeral, looking for anyone or anything that looked out of place. Then he saw the frame in which Amanda had tossed the note on top of her sister's coffin, and wondered if there may be something in there that could give him a clue. Of course, he had to get Rhea's permission to reopen her child's grave. When Nosworthy first approached her, she was adamant that there was no need for it. Amanda had told them all she knew, and surely there was nothing else for the police to find. Nosworthy explained that it was possible that Amanda had details in her subconscious that she hadn't shared, and the letter may give them clues as to those details. Rhea eventually agreed, and Siska's grave was dug up. Since Amanda had only tossed the note on top, there was no need to remove the coffin or exhume Siska, but they did have to sift through a huge amount of soil to find the letter. After weeks of being in the ground, it was barely legible, and did not end up offering any new information. Pressing on, Nosworthy continued to interview friends of the girls. He questioned Amanda's boyfriend, who referred him to Amanda's best friend, a young lady who apparently had a story to tell. The teenager admitted to Nosworthy that Amanda had written her a letter a few weeks before Siska's death. In it, she had described her hatred for her little sister, and she had ended the letter with a chilling statement. She wanted to feed Siska rat poison, or stab her in the heart. The pieces all started to fall into place, and Nosworthy contacted Rhea once again. He wanted to question Amanda. The girl was brought into the charge office at 9pm that night. As she walked through, she would have seen two of her friends, one being the letter recipient, sitting in reception. I have no doubt that this was done to make it very clear to her that the game was up, and that the police knew what she didn't want them to know. At midnight, Rio de Toy saw Nosworthy emerge from the interview room. If she thought that the worst news she had ever heard had been on the 19th of September, 
when she was told that her daughter was dead. That was about to change. Amanda, Nosworthy carefully told the devastated mother, had just confessed to murdering Siska. Rhea de Toy was unable to face her daughter that night. After receiving the news, she stood up and left the police station, leaving her daughter in police custody. In the weeks that followed, Amanda would be interviewed by hordes of psychologists and hypnotised at length in an attempt to get as much information as they could from her. The story that Amanda would eventually tell about that day went as follows. The girls had arrived home after school, and Amanda had made herself a sandwich. She'd taken the 20 centimetre long bread knife off the hook where it hung behind the door, and used it to make her lunch, leaving it on the counter. When they'd come in the front door, Siska had locked the security gate, but left the front door open. A draught blew through, and Amanda went to close it. Siska opened it again and the pair started to scream at each other. Each girl retreated to their respective bedroom, still screaming. Amanda settled into her room to study, and Siska switched on the television. It was loud, and Amanda shouted at her to turn it down. Siska turned the volume higher, she claimed. The screaming began again with the girls swearing at each other. Amanda went down to the kitchen to make herself a hot chocolate, and she says that Siska followed. Amanda claims that Siska was swearing at her, screaming at her, kicked her in the shin, and spat in her face. Then she fled to her bedroom. Amanda says that at that point, she was overcome with rage. She grabbed the bread knife from the kitchen counter and stabbed her sister in the back. Siska turned around and saw the knife and started to scream. Amanda says she began to panic about the fact that she'd stabbed her sister and that her sister was screaming. She says that she just wanted to quiet her down. She threw her onto the bed and started to throttle her to stop her from screaming. She says that Siska was fighting back and managed to get the knife and stabbed her in the head. A feeling that had morphed into fear, swung back into rage, and Amanda says that she'd started to stab her sister over and over. Then Amanda said something that changed everything. She said that when she was stabbing her sister, she didn't see Siska's face. She saw her mother's. She knew that what she was doing would hurt her mother, and with every thrust of the knife, she was accomplishing that goal. Amanda was interviewed by famed criminologist Dr. Irma Labaskachny, who would become an ally to Amanda throughout the proceedings and even after that. Amanda was diagnosed by Dr. Maurice Magna, a psychiatrist at Lentechia Psychiatric Hospital, as having borderline personality disorder. He believed that Amanda was emotionally vulnerable and could kill again if she was provoked. Dr. Irma Labaskachny believed that Amanda had taken her rage over the perceived slights from her mother out on her sister. Borderline personality disorder is characterized by an intense fear of abandonment, even going to extreme measures to avoid real or imagined separation or rejection. A pattern of unstable, intense relationships such as idealising someone one moment and then suddenly believing the person doesn't care enough or is cruel the next. Rapid changes in self-identity and self-image that include shifting goals and values and seeing yourself as bad or as if you don't exist at all. Periods of stress-related paranoia and loss of contact with reality, lasting from a few minutes to a few hours. Impulsive and risky behaviour, such as gambling, reckless driving, unsafe sex, spending sprees, binge eating or drug abuse, or sabotaging success by suddenly quitting a good job or ending a positive relationship. 
suicidal threats or behaviour or self-injury, often in response to a fear of separation or rejection, wide mood swings lasting from a few hours to a few days, which can include intense happiness, irritability, shame or anxiety, ongoing feelings of emptiness, inappropriate intense anger, such as frequently losing your temper, being sarcastic or bitter, or having physical fights. It would emerge in court that this diagnosis fits Amanda's behaviour quite closely, and that she'd had two previous convictions on record for theft. The young woman had been caught in a downward spiral for a long time. Her parents' divorce had only made things worse, and because it was believed that she was simply acting out or being a naughty teenager, she received no psychiatric intervention. Mickey Pistorius says of this case that what stands out for her the most is how Rhea believed that of all her daughters, Amanda was the most likely to share her problems with her. On the other side of the coin, Amanda admitted that she'd never been open with her mother and that there were many things her mother had no idea about. Pistorius underlines how different the parents' perception of their child is, in this case, to the reality, and I think that's an extremely important point. Pistorius ponders whether if any action had been taken after Amanda's theft convictions in terms of counselling, perhaps her borderline personality disorder would have been diagnosed, and she may have gotten the help she needed. As the trial proceeded, the community of Mount Pleasant was once again cast into turmoil. It had been bad enough that one of their own, such a young child, could be murdered by an intruder, but this, the truth, was just unbelievable. As evidence was led during the trial, it became clear to the community that the household that had seemed so happy and stable was really a bit of a pressure cooker waiting to explode, as Chris Carsten puts it. There was evidence led about alleged alcohol abuse in the house, tension between the girls and their mother, and further difficulties once she moved her boyfriend in. A major sticking point in the home were the popular Doc Martin shoes. Both Amanda and Siska wanted a pair, but only Siska got a pair as a reward for getting her Eastern Transvaal colours in netball. It's alleged that Amanda wore her sister's shoes after the murder, and it would become this that would stick in the minds of the public. Amanda would become the girl that had killed her sister over a pair of shoes. It was simplistic, and although hard to believe, a far better option for the public than the complex and intertwined tale that was the reality. Amanda's family attended the trial every day. Her father Dennis came too, but sat on the opposite end of the court from his ex-wife and oldest daughter. Despite the very poor picture it painted of the family, Amanda's defence team did their best to portray the girl as an unwitting victim of her circumstances, combined with her personality disorder. She'd been willing to plead guilty to culpable homicide, but the judge rejected that. The evidence led by her friend around the letter she'd written detailing her desire to kill her sister showed premeditation. In Judge Chris Liebenberg's opinion, this had not been something that had happened on the spur of the moment. Amanda had thought about, and perhaps planned, Siska's murder. She had also contrived a detailed story to cover up her actions. If she really had snapped in the moments and acted out of pure rage, the judge felt that she would have readily admitted to that after the crime, not sent the police on a wild goose chase, and left her family in terror and grief for weeks, before eventually being forced to tell the truth. And to be honest, I have to agree. These were not the actions of a remorseful person that had acted in the heat of the moment. And while I can understand that it would have been extremely difficult to admit to what she had done, 
if it had truly been a horrible mistake, as her defense team would allege, admitting to it would have been the best thing to do. The fact that she wrote about killing her sister beforehand also begs concern. Everyone has some sort of violent fantasy, whether as children, teenagers or adults. Even if you just briefly fantasize about punching someone in the face, that is a violent fantasy. It's also not uncommon for sibling relationships to become so heated that one might make threats against another. We don't know what was really going through Amanda's mind when she wrote that letter to her friend. Was that threat just a way of expressing how deeply aggrieved she felt? A way to emphasize her pain? Although saying that you want to stab someone in the heart, and then for all intents and purposes actually doing exactly that, is something quite different. Amanda Toy was sentenced to 15 years behind bars, with five years suspended. Her defence counsel's request to appeal was denied, and she was taken down to start serving her sentence. Irma Labaskachny requested that Amanda be placed initially in a juvenile facility in Kronstadt's women's prison, instead of Port Elizabeth's North End prison, known as the Red Hell. Labaskachny was of the opinion that Amanda would be far more likely to rehabilitate there than in a general prison. The judge agreed, and the girl started to serve her sentence with five other minor females in the facility. She decorated her cell with photographs of her sister and slept with one of Siska's teddy bears. She said that for the first six months of her imprisonment, she dreamt about Siska every night. In her dreams, her sister was at home, waiting for her to join her, and they would do things together again like they used to. She struggled to take advantage of counselling services in prison, and said that she felt like the event was something that had happened to her, rather than something she had done herself. Amanda passed matric in prison in 1995, and would go on to qualify as a commercial makeup artist and, and hairdresser. Her mother visited her as often as she could, considering Kruenstadt is eight and a half hours drive from Port Elizabeth. When she turned 21, Amanda was moved into the adult section of Kruenstadt's women's prison. In the year 2000, she was crowned Miss Kruenstadt in a prison beauty pageant that was aired on carte blanche. Her mother was proud of the girl's progress, and seemed to support her as much as she could. In 2002, Amanda received the news that she would be released on parole, and Irma Lavaskachny stepped in to help her prepare emotionally for life on the outside. Together, they prepared for the fact that Amanda would be re-entering the world as a woman, and it was a very different world than the one she'd left behind. She would be living with her mother, initially in the same house in which Siska had died. She also knew that dealing with the community would be a challenge. To them, she was still, after all, the girl that had killed her sister over a pair of shoes. Most sources about this case end with Amanda being spirited back to Port Elizabeth at midnight in 2002, being reunited with her mother and a photograph of the woman walking hand in hand with her mother out of the Correctional Services Facility in Port Elizabeth. Most sources end with this as the last image of Amanda, walking off into a future, having served her time, and now ready to be a contributing member of society. But that is not where Amanda de Toy's story ends, not by a long shot. The Amanda that emerged outside of prison is described in a few media articles, and I also had the honour of speaking with someone that would experience, if only second-hand, the turmoil that still raged in her. Amanda seemingly did her best to reintegrate at first. She worked as a waitress and lived in her mother's home. 
she agreed to an interview with the media soon after her release, probably hoping to show the public that she'd grown up and changed. In it, she explains that she realized that her view of her family as a child was very skewed, and that she only understood after Siska's death that her mother actually did love her very much. In the article, Amanda expresses great hope for the future, but it seems, and Rhea also says, that the community they lived in was having none of it. Rhea would later describe how Amanda had been embarrassed in public, and people had called her a monster. On one occasion, a woman had accidentally driven into Amanda's car, and on realizing who she was, told her that she was sorry about the accident, but that it was nothing compared to what she had done. Although it sounds cruel, I can sort of understand the community's difficulty in accepting Amanda back into the fold again. Yes, she'd served her time, but for the people that had known and loved Siska, or really anyone that had been touched by the horror of that day, that would have been little solace. Of course, no one was asking people to welcome her back with open arms, and they didn't have to call her names or humiliate her publicly, but I do wonder if people felt like they were standing up for Siska in some way by doing so. I think this reaction simply speaks to the far-reaching effects of this type of crime on society. People find it very difficult to let go, regardless of how much time someone serves for their crime. At some point, Amanda moved into her own little apartment. She had, however, started to drink, and whether or not that was a way of pushing down pain that she'd yet to deal with, it got her into a lot of trouble. Between 2005 and 2007, she was involved in two incidents where she was found to be driving under the influence. In one case, she was charged, but the charges were withdrawn. During this period, Amanda became friends with the woman that lived next door to my anonymous source, who I will call M. At the time of the incident I'm about to describe, M had no idea about Amanda's past, she would only find out in the ensuing period that followed. The neighbour had a 16-year-old daughter, who we will call D, and one night, Amanda, now in her late 20s, took D out clubbing. I had a conversation with M about why the older woman would have been out with this younger child, a minor, essentially, when she was actually friends with the girl's mother, we have no idea how Dee came to be in the company of Amanda that night, or whether it was with her mother's consent, but I do wonder if Amanda felt more comfortable around younger people after she left prison. Her life had essentially stalled while she was inside, and she wouldn't be at the same level as others her age. That is one consideration and the other is that she might have been trying to reconstruct her failed relationship with her younger sister. Either way, the evening took an almost fatal turn when Amanda, intoxicated, lost control of her vehicle, and it overturned. They remained in the vehicle unconscious for some time before they were discovered. Amanda recovered without any permanent injury, but 16-year-old D suffered severe brain trauma and would spend a long time in a care facility. She never fully recovered and lives with the physical and mental damage of that accident to this day. M's brother, who we will call Q, was dating D at the time and he was devastated by the complete change in the girl's personality due to the brain trauma. This is what Q had to say about the accident and its after-effects on his, Dee's, and so many other lives. Quote, Dee was about 16 at the time of the incident, and we lived next door to each other. We often spent afternoons talking together, and I loved her very much. Unfortunately, after the accident, her personality changed, and it seems like she got stuck at being 16 forever. In 2008, 
I saw her for the last time. Her short-term memories are affected and when I last heard, she was in a care facility. We were never sure if she'd be able to live a normal life. I think the most important thing to realise is that our life choices impact those around us more than we sometimes realise and the damage we can cause could be irreversible. End quote. Dee was eventually able to leave the care facility and she is now working. She suffers from many lasting effects and there is no doubt that her physical and mental health have suffered irreparable damage. There are no media reports of this accident and no mention of whether there was any consideration of charging Amanda with any crime. Had Dee died, things would likely have been far more serious. As it was, the damage was bad enough. It appears that Amanda's downward spiral continued from that point, and at times she would say to friends that she wished she'd received the death penalty because she didn't feel like she deserved to be alive. In 2009, a man driving behind a vehicle watched the driver lose control and then overturn and slam into a tree. The driver was Amanda Dutoy. Paramedics were unable to revive her, and she died on the scene. Once again, Rhea de Toy would receive the news of the death of her daughter. This time, her mother would blame her child's death on an unforgiving public and unscrupulous media, who she said had tormented Amanda every day after she'd left prison. A blog I found details the sadness that one woman felt at the ongoing tragedy that had seemingly been Amanda's life. The woman had been Amanda's teacher in high school when she'd killed her sister. She had seen signs of self-harm on the girl and tried to get her help. She says that her concerns were dismissed as Amanda just acting out. Weeks later, Siska was dead. After Amanda's death, Rhea had said that she'd hoped that wherever she was now, that she was experiencing peace. She said, quote, Forget her now. She isn't here to throw stones at anymore. End quote. It was this statement that made me wonder whether I should even cover this case. Was I going to be doing more harm than good by dredging up a story that is now, for all intents and purposes, over? Except it isn't over. And I hope that if anyone that loved Amanda is listening to this, you do not take this as a slight. But her choices have lived on after her, and it is for that reason that telling the story is still very valid and very important. Amanda is no longer here to live the life she may have wanted to. She no longer has the physical power to try and make up for what she did. But maybe her story can still do that. As long as we tell it in the right way. If one person listens to Siska and Amanda's story and recognises that their child needs help before it is too late, maybe that is enough to make up in some small way for all the pain that has been caused and continues to be lived. I think that Siska's murder was just a horrible confluence of circumstances. Many children feel left out and are jealous of their siblings. But when that, the family dynamic and Amanda's mental disorders were combined, it set her on a path to destruction. That could have ended when she walked out of prison, but sadly, it didn't. I understand her mother's feeling that her daughter was tormented, but we cannot discount free will. Amanda could have chosen to leave the place that knew her past so well. She could have started afresh somewhere else. Amanda could have chosen to get treatment for the binge drinking issue which was clearly out of hand. 
she could have chosen not to drive drunk with a 16-year-old child in her vehicle. But then, in hindsight, everything is 2020, and it's never really that simple at the time. Siska de Toy did not deserve to die. Amanda de Toy should not be dead either. Dee should be the person she was before she got into that car. Rhea should not have to mourn two children and the horrific circumstances that surrounded the death of both. Q should not have to wonder what might have been. But here we are. And if all that we can hope for is a little bit of insight for someone out there to make a different choice, then maybe that will have to be enough. Siska, rest gently. Amanda, I hope that you have found peace. And to all those left behind, may your pain never be unbearable. Thank you for listening to episode 48, The Murder of Siska de Toy. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a Spotlight Minisode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. 